This is Vern Denham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. In the United States of America, around much of the Western world, and the democratizing world, the three great quests are said to be for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But what is happiness? How do you achieve it? How do you know when you really have it? The art of being happy lies in the power of extracting happiness from common things, said Henry Ward Beecher. Happiness isn't so much a matter of position as it is of disposition. How do you feel inside? If it's a matter of your inner life, what is your inner life? What thoughts, meanings, values, and responses do you have to existence, to life in this universe? Is there some great cosmic plan, or do you think you're just wandering aimlessly from situation to situation, personality to personality, relationship to relationship, town to town, but that there's no meaning to it? If that's what you believe, that's what your life is going to be like. It'll be meaningless. It'll seem as if you're trapped by trivialities just keeping yourself occupied. Just keep your hands busy. Just keep your schedule busy, your calendar, your date book, and you'll be happy. That is happiness or a reasonable facsimile thereof. Was it really just being obsessively, compulsively active at things? There's a higher purpose. Active at what? And for what? For what reason? For what purpose? For what great design and plan? Just because you feel you have what the psychologists call muscle hunger and you have to do something, you might as well be drumming your fingers on a table or twiddling your thumbs. So instead you say, well, I'll go out and enter into volunteer activity or play a lot of games or go down to the recreation hall or go to the movies or rent some videos or whatever. Just always obsessively, compulsively feeling you have to do something. But for what purpose? Why are you doing something? And what is done when you are through doing something? What have you accomplished? Is there some sense of real, actualized achievement from it? Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher, said the whole purpose of life is to bring your potentiality into actuality, that that is what God is doing in your life. That's what God's will is for your life, to take you a package of potentials and make you an abundance of actuals, to make you an actuality of that which is only potential or possible within yourself now. That's God's will for your life, because you are of God. You are from God. You are a son or daughter of God. God is the creator. God is the infinite mind which brought everything to be, the architect of time and space, and the very God who governs this solar system can govern your life. The God whose mind plans out this universe of universes, the star clusters, the galaxies, the great comets and meteorites, the suns, and the vast, incredible interstellar distances of outer space, if you've ever gone to an observatory and looked through a telescope. That God who created all that created you, and the God who has a plan for all of that has a plan for your life as well. The God who designed and keeps all of this universe of universes, galaxies, and star clusters running can run your life and keep your life running, and not just for your so-called three score years and 10, 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this earth, but for all eternity lying beyond. That is the promise 2,000 years ago, more vividly than any time in the halls of human history, that promise was given 2,000 years ago by this charismatic carpenter who came proclaiming a new way of life, a new way of faith, fearless of life and fearless of death. You can live in that way, that you can actually live without fear. Isn't fear part of the human condition? Isn't it a part of you as certainly as... Your skin color and the color of your eyes, your own genetics, the imprint of your birth, isn't that what is part of being mortal on this earth that you're going to be fearful? It is not. There is the conquest of fear. Jesus said again and again, fear not. Be not anxious. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You can live fearless of life and fearless of death because what is there to fear of life? When your life is in liaison with the very creator of life, the one who is the founder of life, the architect of time and space, and why fear eternity? When the eternal God, who is the source of eternity, is your loving father and your friend. You cannot just have some vague, sort of generalized good feeling that maybe somewhere there's a beneficent something or other, somewhere or other, and that the universe is not entirely hostile. No, Jesus said this universe is friendly. 2,000 years ago, he came saying, this is a loving place. It may not look that way. 
nature may, as some philosophers have said, seem red in tooth and claw. And there may be hostility, it seems, as you read the headlines and you see war and rumor of war and earthquakes in diverse places and problems and vicissitudes and crime. And yet, at the very heart of it all, there's a loving God who has given human beings, including you yourself, free will. You do not dance like a puppet on a string. You are a free will, mortal human being, a son or daughter of God, invested in your mind with that capacity for making choices, choosing alternatives, looking over what you want to do, and then making that decision. And that decision will result in either happiness or unhappiness for you and for countless others as well. Success is getting what you want. Happiness is wanting what you get. That's part of it. But when what you want to get is that which is the greatest possible good in this universe of universes, when what you want to get is the will of God, when what you want for your life is the noblest, the truest, the most sublime experience in all of life, the very plan of the Creator for your life, then you are wanting for your life the same thing that God wants for your life. And when the human will and the divine will are in such synchrony as that, tremendous things can begin to happen, and you can discover it for yourself. There was a French magazine years ago, one time asked its readers to send in their definitions of what happiness is, what constitutes it, what makes for a happy life. And one correspondent said, happiness is the art of making a bouquet of those flowers within reach. The art of making a bouquet of whatever flowers and petals and plants are within your reach. Within your reach is something you've never dreamed of. For the Master proclaimed the kingdom of God is within you, not just close at hand, though it is that, but within you. The kingdom of God is inside you. A fragment of infinity, a glowing ember of eternity, glows burn smolders to illumine your mind, your thinking, your life. You don't have to look someplace else for it. It's right there where you are. Listening to this broadcast, listening to this, the kingdom of God is there within you. Happiness is a great paradox. It can grow in any soil, live in any condition. It defies environment. The reason for this is that I said it does not come from without, it comes from within. And whenever you see somebody who is seeking happiness continually outside of himself or outside of herself, you can be certain that person has not found it. When you see a person going from amusement to amusement, entertainment to entertainment, from activity to activity, obsessively, compulsively trying to find something that will still that disquieting discontent inside the heart, you know that person has not found real happiness. When it's going from alcohol to pills to things that you sniff to inhalants to every form of psychotropic and psychedelic drug and thinking you're going to be happy because you ingest something into yourself, which of course eventually you excrete in some form or another, no high, as one drug addict told me, lasts forever. Some of them don't last very long at all. So what is the real source of happiness? Something you don't get rid of in your biochemistry, but something which is permanently there that really is a source of joy. It is spiritual because the Spirit gives life. The Spirit of God is there with you and within you this very moment, illumining your mind. It is written, the Spirit in man is the candle of God or the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inmost parts. Happiness depends, first of all, on the inside of you. No amount of the external things of happy activity around you will produce happiness if the inside is full of the poison of anger and revenge and hatred and cruelty. The basis for happiness is something to do, something to love, something to look forward to. All of that is contained in the joy of spiritual truth. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, what's so joyous about spiritual truth? Truth is just something written maybe on a page. No, I'm not talking about that. Or something you memorize to recite on Saturdays or Sundays or whatever day of particular religiosity you observe. It's something that's inside that's alive. Truth is alive. You shall know the truth. The truth will make you free. There is a spiritual freedom in that. There is a liquid liberty of enlightened sonship or daughterhood with God. There is something amiss in the person who knows the right way and says he knows the right way and declares this is the correct way, but he still wants some more time to think about it before he actually takes that right way. If you know it, and if you really do with clarity see it in this moment, then take it, choose it, 
Embrace it. Clasp it to yourself with hoops of steel, as they would say in Shakespearean English. But don't let it out of your sight. If it's real and if you know it in this moment, then claim it by faith this moment. Feelings have to do with your own fluctuating condition. Feelings. But faith has to do not with your fluctuating condition, but with God's unfluctuating love, God's enduring forgiveness, God's eternal nature. You are a son or daughter of God. You are kin to the Creator. God has a reason for you to be alive on this earth, and if you haven't found it yet, you haven't found, no matter what your age, however young, however old, you have not found what life is really all about until you find that. One psychologist wrote, it's natural for people to be happy and satisfied after they have done something which is a good piece of work. Well, what accounts for so much of the misery in the world then? So many people haven't found what they feel is a really good piece of work to do. There's an old English proverb, there's no happiness in this world. Listen to this proverb, what a philosophy. There's no happiness in this world, so we just have to be happy without it. When life has drug you through a knothole backward, as one of my friends says, if you feel as if you've been rebuked, abused, despised, and rejected, nothing's going right, nothing ever will, you need to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not just an oncoming train, that there is a better day coming. Why? Because things change with the passage of time. The old saying, time heals all wounds. Time also wounds all heals. Think about that. There's no happiness in the world, says the English proverb, so we have to be happy without it. You have to have the ability to hang on. But what are you hanging on to? If you're hanging on just to a feeble, faint ray of hope that's generated in your own mind and it's going to expire when your own mind does, that's not much of a hope. But if you're hanging on, if you're clinging on to the very creator, the power behind this universe, the intellect that created it all, then you're hanging on not just to some faint, illusory, ephemeral something or other. You are in liaison with God. And when God and man, God and human beings, man, woman, or child, go into partnership, great things begin to happen, can and will and do take place. Now just think about how happy you'd be if you lost everything, everything you have right now, and then suddenly got it all back again. You know, you could lose everything you have right now. It's happened before. It's happened to people. It'll change your philosophy. Things can change. You can say things can change for the worse or for the better. Well, what you call better and what you call worse is strictly an emotional appraisal of the moment. What's really good for you is what's really spiritual. Love, truth, beauty, goodness. The love of God and the love of people. Friendship. These spiritual values do not decay. They don't wither away. They don't die on the vine. These things are real. And when you find God, you have found the source of these spiritual realities, the greatest things in all the universe. You can't even call them things. It's too paltry a word to use to describe. And when you begin to live by these eternal values, you have begun to live eternally. It can begin this moment, not at some far distant date or on some New Year's Eve or New Year's Day or some religious holiday, it can begin in your consciousness this moment because the most important things that happen in your life begin in your consciousness because in your consciousness, that's where the Spirit of God is this moment, testifying to you, bearing witness that this is true, the God who loves you, who has newness of life for you, and in this very instant, if you'll give your life without holding anything back, give your life to God in faith and trust all things, all things will begin all over for you. All things will be made new, beginning here now, this very instant. And then write to us, will you? Want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080-3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. I've written things on prayer, worship, finding God, getting to know God. Any and all of this literature, yours free, no cost, charge, or obligation, just write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. Post Office Box 3080 Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.